We're back. We're live. We're here. One o'clock rock for CCBO, climate change beyond outrage. I'm Jay Fidel in the studio, and I'm acting as the Uber host, or what I want to call it, the provocative host, uh, provoking uh, Anu uh, Hittel, who is in St. Louis, Missouri, at Washington State University, and reporting to us. She's a real host, but today she's our guest. She's reporting uh, about a conference there, uh, the Global Partnership for Plant uh, Conservation, which is part of the United National Convention on Biodiversity. Hi, Anu. Hi, Jay. Great to Aloha, see you. Aloha, namaskar, and hello from St. Louis, Missouri. It's a great university, one of the best. Yes, and it's, it's actually Washington University in St. Louis. It's not Washington State University. Got it. Anyway, so what are you doing there? So I was at a meeting last week of people from around the world who work on saving plants. And where would they meet but at a botanical garden? So I got some clips of the venue for you because just to show you how beautiful it was last week. And And that's part of the university then, eh? No, that's not part of the university. It's a, it's a non-profit that's separate from the university. Mm -hmm. Okay. And the Missouri Botanical Garden is actually one of the three largest botanical gardens in the world. Mm -hmm. uh, after the Q Royal Botanic Gardens and New York Botanical Garden. You spent some so time at, uh, at uh, Washington University in, in St. Louis before, haven't you? Yes, I'm an instructor here as well. Okay, so you know your way around botanical yes. gardens and otherwise. <laughs> yes, I do. <laughs> so are you spending... And I actually worked at the botanical gardens as well, so... Oh, uh, really? So I've been okay, around. So but, a um, special affinity for the botanical gardens. Right, there are a couple of other clips, uh, a couple of other photographs of the gardens, if, um, you know, at some point if we can show them. But I just wanted to mention that plants are so crucial to everyone's life. They're central. And it's not just plants alone, but the different kinds of plants, what these folks call biodiversity. Okay, and so it's that diversity of plants that help us to adapt to changes, especially climate change, which is my area of interest. And so losing plant species at rates like never before, which is what's happening right now, this is a big problem. And the meeting was really about addressing that extinction problem. Mm -hmm. So uh, we had a collection of botanists and scientists and educators from 27 different countries. They gathered together for three days. They closeted themselves away from this beautiful garden into a conference room, uh, 30 presentations in two days. And um, we did come up briefly to have a reception, but uh, basically we talked about how we could play a role, how botanical gardens could play a role in preventing those extinctions and preventing plants from becoming basically as extinct as the dodo bird. You said uh, experts. What kinds of experts? What kind of degrees and experience did they have as experts? Everything from land management and natural resources to PhDs in more academic disciplines, uh, science communication. So there was someone from Smithsonian there. Um, there were people who mostly there were scientists and educators and botanists. So. The big question was, what's the role that bio biodiversity, I'm sorry, that botanical gardens play in the strategy? There is a, a sister agreement to the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, which is what I deal with. Mm -hmm. And we've all heard about that Paris Agreement and so on, right? Yes, we've heard and about it. And there's, like there's a sister agreement to that. It's a little lesser known. It's called the Convention on Biodiversity. It was signed the same time as the Climate Change Convention, which was 1992. And since it's about 196 parties to that convention, so it's about the size of the climate change one, but they don't meet every year. They meet every other year. And they basically focus on 
preventing the loss of these species, not just plants, but biodiversity in general. So we're looking at species of fish, amphibians, birds, reptiles, everything that lives. Okay. So basically these folks got together under that convention and there's a strategy specifically for plants. And we have a, a group that works on that strategy. And that group is called the GPPC, which is the Global Partnership on Plant Conservation. So that's what the meeting was. And we have an opening statement, especially for our think tech audience, that uh, the host of the Missouri Botanical Garden, the head of the, the Botanical Garden put together. So if you want to show that. Sure, let's watch that now. Looking forward so much to um, opening the conference on uh, plant conservation and the sustainable development goals. It's a really great opportunity to, to make sure that plant conservation is included in, uh, in and amongst the great uh, challenges facing the world community. And this conference should play a really important part in uh, seeing how we fit into that great um, new challenge for, for the world. Okay. Okay, very interesting. So, uh, well, and he did that just for us then, eh? Yes, I caught him before he went in for the <laughs> opening statement and asked if he would like to speak to our audience in Hawaii, knowing that the World Conservation Congress will be happening there in a couple of months. So, uh, one of the main things about botanical gardens and their role is that they actually help prevent some of these extinctions. And they're growing these plants at the gardens all around the world. So people had come from 27 different countries to talk about this. And it really was an international agreement down to the botanic garden level, the really the nitty gritty, so to speak, <laughs> pun intended, I guess, <laughs> uh, that level where they were really talking about what plant species and what have they achieved uh, in relation to those sustainable development goals that the UN had put out last fall. And they were talking about what kinds of targets and how do they measure up mm -hmm. to what, what those targets were. So what performances have they done? And so we're really looking at uh, some major outcomes. But before that, I thought maybe we could look at a couple of the clips of people who had attended these sessions. And there, some of them are quite uh, sort of big wigs in the field. OK, let's take a look at that. So why don't you tell me what you hope for the conference and what are the outcomes, what brings you here? Um, okay, so um, I work for an organisation called Botanic Gardens Conservation oh. International, BTCI, and we work with a um, network of botanic gardens around the world with a focus on promoting plant conservation um, and environmental education work in botanic gardens. So we've been very much involved on the conservation side in the global strategy for plant conservation and trying to promote conservation in botanic gardens in the framework of the GSPC. Um, the strategy runs up to 2020 and we're aware that in, in 2020 we will need to re either renew the strategy or look at the process for ensuring that plant conservation work continues to have a framework for action. So this conference is a way of starting to look forward to what would be the picture for plant conservation um, after 2020. Um, we're aware that one of the main um, development agendas that is coming up, um, to the fore at the moment is the Sustainable Development Agenda. And countries are looking at how they can react and then put in place processes to achieve sustainable development goals. So what we want to do by this conference is look at how plant conservation can contribute to sustainable development, where there are linkages between plant conservation and sustainable development goals, so that we can um, develop a framework that will support plant conservation, but will put it very much in the context of other processes that are going on at the national level. All right, so if you want to just tell me, you know, where you're from and uh, who you are and, and that, okay. that we can start with that. Okay, um, so I'm Basma Ali from Jordan and I'm the founder of the Royal Botanic Garden in Jordan. And I've come here to Missouri to this meeting because uh, we want to share our experiences and we um, uh, talked, I spoke about our case study of integrating local and rural communities as part of 
uh, sustainable management of our landscapes and ecosystems. And we hope to actually exchange information and share information with other botanic gardens and other entities that work in this field as well and hopefully promote uh, the GSPC, which is the Global um, Strategy for Plant Conservation. Hopefully. All right, so who are you? And tell me why you came to this meeting. Yeah, my name is Peggy Allwell. I'm the Plant Conservation Program Lead for the Bureau of Land Management. And I came to this meeting to talk about the National Seed Strategy, which was launched in 2015, and to encourage partnerships between the federal government and the botanic garden world. I think what's going to be the, the top topic of conversation is what's coming in the next four years. The present version of the, of the global strategy for plant conservation has a due date of 2020. That's not very far off and not all of the targets will be achieved by then. Some of them probably will get done. And in addition to just the targets themselves, what's really important right now is that uh, the global strategy as a standalone document um, is, I think, being looked at by everybody as to how it's going to work in the future. Will there be a separate global strategy for plant conservation? Will it make more sense just to try to talk much more about plant conservation in the context of all of the other international agreements. A couple of them are becoming extremely important now. One is called the Aichi Biodiversity Targets, and this is a group of, of targets that have been set up by the Convention on Biological Diversity to try to help the world community conserve biodiversity and use it sustainably. And the other is uh, the Sustainable Development Goals for 2030. And this is a group of 17 goals with a whole bunch of targets underneath them that the world community has agreed to through the UN about everything from reducing poverty, improving human health, uh, taking care of the land, addressing climate change. Again, very, very lofty global goals. But many of them, and this is what the conference this week's been talking about, many of them can't be achieved without plants. What do you hope to achieve at the meeting on, on Thursday? Actually, um, from my personal perspective, I would like to see how we can best promote um, other botanic gardens and other people who work in the plant conservation world in the Middle East um, to promote them to develop their national strategies for plant conservation and further that within their own countries. So we want to see, from my perspective, I would like to see how I can utilize that meeting to better promote it in our region, hopefully. Jordan has started the process, um, but I think it's imperative that other countries around us do the same. I understand it's not easy given the political situation, but it is a priority. Well, very interesting, Anu. Good job. I mean, that really helps us understand what's happening at the conference and uh, what people are doing about the issue. I just wonder, something raised in that discussion though, where does this fit with uh, the initiative about global climate change? It's a, it's a world initiative. It's important to preserve the planet and the, the inhabitants of the planet and all that. But it, 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 it's hard to put it inside, you know, the wrapper of global climate change, isn't it? Well, it is a sister convention to the climate change convention. So they work in parallel, but they have a lot of cross-cutting programs. Mm -hmm. And so these, these folks work on climate change issues as well. So there's a lot of climate change issues where they're looking at modeling to figure out where the plants will move to or where you can reestablish populations, things like that. But there's, um, it was an interesting... Uh, point that I forgot to mention that this strategy right now goes till 2020 and one of the participants uh, talked about that, Suzanne Sharrock from uh, Botanic Gardens Conserva Conservation International and she talked about what's going to happen beyond 2020 and then David Galbraith at Royal Botanic Gardens in Canada 
talked about, will this be a standalone strategy or will it move into the other agreements like the framework on climate change? So there is some um, uh, ambiguity right now as to what will happen. And on the third day that they got together, they were there just by invitation only. So I did not secure an invitation to that one. Oh. But these were people working directly on the strategy and what they hoped to accomplish with the UN liaison who was there. So it was really quite exciting. But this is, in a way, it doesn't look so exciting because there are a bunch of people sitting around uh, PowerPoint presentations and a table. But it's really policy, international and global policy being made. And it's just like the sister convention on climate change, only it's more at a nitty-gritty level, as I said before. Well, how do you, uh, you know, encourage biodiversity? How do you prevent plants from going extinct? What affirmative action do you take? There are a number of things, and many of those are things that the botanical gardens are dealing with. They, however, work in partnership with federal agencies as well. So Peggy Olwell, who was there from the Bureau of Land Management, she was there to encourage what she calls the power of partnerships. And so they work hand in hand to educate, communicate, and then actually grow plants, do the science behind where these plants should be put back into the wild. And so those are the kinds of things they work on. They also include uh, schools and school groups that visit the gardens, but they also do outreach and, and communication into mm -hmm. the, the various institutions. You know, we so have a really, lion mm -hmm. arboretum uh, right at the end of the road in Manoa, up the hill there, uh, and uh, they are doing that. Uh, there are many plants in Hawaii that have been uh, jeopardized, threatened, and are at risk of going extinct, and they keep them. It's a, it's a plant bank with uh, thousands of uh, various different kinds of plants that are kept in a uh, you know, protected environment and ready to be replanted uh, because That's their correct. original home is no longer available. It's been built or you know, paved over, but, but th they're ready to go to another home. And uh, the, the issue that's raised, I think, by all of this is that as m humankind uh, takes over the habitat of plants and makes it hard for them to survive, one way or the other. I mean, clearly that's been happening a long time. And you, and you protect them and save them uh, at an arboretum or at a botanical garden. Where and when can you replant them? Uh, what's the plan on that? There are many reintroduction plans that are going on even in Hawaii. So the Lion Arboretum and Honolulu Botanical Garden System, Waimea Arboretum, Amy Greenwell Ethnobotanical Garden, on the Big Island, uh, National Tropical Botanical Garden. These are all gardens that have been working with federal and private and other land managing agencies to put these uh, these plants back out on the wild. Well, so in terms of uh, there's a lot of there are some, however, that have lost their habitats, and there are just a few individuals left. Uh, they're not a viable population, so. We'll have to wait until such time when we can have an appropriate place to put them back out. They're stranded. They're stranded orphans, and we have to find a plan. You know, you have to feel bad for them. We, we, I mean, it's an emotional experience, actually, uh, because they but were when we have when we do find a place, then we will have the germplasm or the tissue or the seeds to put out there. So, and that's what these gardens are. They're repositories of this material. Mm -hmm. So uh, you, you said at the outset, Anu, and I'd like to pursue it a little bit, is that this is important that we protect, you know, these plants that are at risk of extinction. Uh, why is that so? What does it mean ultimately to the world and to us? Uh, I mean, aside of, you know, having a, a protecting it, you know, as a sort of a conceptual thing, but what about us? Do, do, are we interested in our, uh, is our own welfare individually and collectively, by country or by, by the world, are we affected by the loss of these plants? Well, if you said that only one species were to disappear and what does, difference does that make, then I would say, you know, maybe there's not such a huge impact. But when you're looking at 10,000 species a year disappearing, um, then there is a big impact because you're looking at what effect this would have on our food security on our 
med medicines that we get from these plants. Um, they're basically a library of information that we need to save because we don't know what we will need in the future since we'll have a changing climate and we don't know what that's going to bring. Can we recreate plants or putting it another way, can we create plants using uh, gene altering techniques uh, that will do exactly what we, we think is necessary to protect the wild? Isn't that possible? Sure, it's possible, but I think for the most part, these folks were really looking at preserving the wild uh, information that's out there in those plants. So that's what these folks are about, because that's your base information. That's the information you go back to. Um, so that's what they're looking at, uh, trying to bank and trying to figure out a strategy, because how do you prioritize when you've got such huge extinction rates? Yeah. What do you save first? Yes. So that's what they're trying to prioritize. And they're also trying to figure out how are they doing compared to the sustainable development goals and the other targets that have been set out there, the international targets. How, how do you make those priorities? And what considerations go into making that list of the most important ones and maybe not so important ones? What do you consider? Right. So they look at a number of different things. I mean, you're looking at how many populations are left. You're looking at uh, how many relatives of it, of that particular species. You're looking at the possible being able to actually figure out whether you can grow this plant even outside of its natural habitat. Mm -hmm. So it's a combination of a lot of different things. And that this, scientists actually have strategies about these. Mm -hmm. So they have these strategic uh, consultations, which is one of the things that they're doing. They do come up with priorities for their regions. Is it, um, you know, but in the way of nature, in the wild, so to speak, not everything survives naturally. It's not always, you know, humankind that is doing dastardly things to the plants in the wild. Sometimes it's time for that plant to go extinct. It's in, in the order of things. Not every plant lasts forever. Well, how do right, you, there are how natural the extinctions. Yeah, how do the scientists deal with that? Right, there are natural extinctions and there is a natural order of life. But what we're doing and what we're seeing is that there is a very accelerated rate. So what might have taken tens of thousands of years to become extinct in the past is now only taking perhaps a decade. Mm -hmm. And when we have a changing climate that's coming to us, then we won't know how to deal with that. We won't have the ammunition to deal with that. We won't have the plants that we need if we have them become extinct by the, by, before the time when we use them. So I think it's really the rate of that disappearance. That's alarming, yes. We have some more video clips. And uh, you know, while we, while we watch these uh, video clips at this beautiful botanical garden, um, I, am, I am wondering, Anu, uh, where the money comes from. Uh, who funds these efforts? Who funds the botanical gardens? I suppose that's community-based. And who funds the research? And uh, how is it doing, the funding, I mean? Do you, you get any sense of that at this conference? Well, the funding is always an issue. Uh, it's funding for science and it's funding for natural resource management. So it's your usual gamut of funders, you know, government, private, individuals, foundations, and so on. But uh, I think that one of the interesting things about this convention really was that it provides that framework for these folks to work on these very important issues. And it gives a national level um, sort of stature. Mm -hmm. So for our, uh, the princess from Jordan, Her Royal Highness, uh, Princess Basma Ali, who we interviewed, she said that her garden would not basically have existed if it hadn't been for the Convention of Biodiversity and the efforts that they're doing to save those plants. Those are uh, really because of that Convention on Biodiversity. So I think that's an interesting uh, aspect to all of these meetings. 
Well, you know, one issue that, that strikes me is that we know that certain plants um, are exotic and could lead to uh, extraordinary pharmaceutical developments. Who knows, maybe cure cancer. And certainly we want to prevent the, the extinction of those plants. And I'm, I'm sure there's a lot of exotic plants that have possibilities out there. What, what, what troubles me, though, is we don't know about the possibilities of a lot of other plants. We don't know. Um, and it will take many years of uh, pharmaceutical research, you know, biochemical research to find out that some magic is, magic is found in those plants that seem to be, may I say, garden variety, but they're not really garden variety at all. And, I mean, how does that play in this decision process? I mean, all plants, uh, you know, could be miracles. How do you, how right. do you identify that before you know it's a miracle plant? Well, that's the, that's the reason for having these plants banked, right? So you don't know what you have. And if you don't know what you have, you don't know what you're going to lose. Yeah. And that's a really tricky problem. Yeah. And Aldo Leopold said something about how he, he likened this to the burning of the library at Alexandria to if you burn that library, you are lost all that information. And so you burn the rainforest or you lose these species, you've lost all that information. So you really want to keep that. Yeah. And there is a priority setting system because you can't keep everything. But that's what our scientists were working on. Is this a growing area of science, Anu? Is this something where more young people are uh, opting to go into it, where more scientists are dedicating their efforts to it, where more organizations around the world are meeting like this one? I wish that were the case. What's actually happening is that botany is disappearing from universities. And it would be great to see botany coming back because that is really what we need. There are young people going into other aspects of science, but not into botany. And that's a real problem. So botanists might become an extinct species. <laughs> there you have it. Botanists, too, could become extinct. Well, right. and the other message is <clears throat> go study botany, young, young person. <laughs> yes, that's a big message, is that study botany because those, that science is so basic to what we're trying to save. Yes. Thank you so much, Anu. This has been a great discussion. I'm so happy you're there, and I'm so happy you're reporting back and giving us all this great footage and information about the conference. That's it's Anu Hiddle. Great to Hiddle. be here. She's reporting on the Global Partnership for Plant Conservation, which is part of the United, Nationals, United Nations Convention on Biodiversity, uh, DBC. Thank you so much, Anu. Bye-bye. Aloha. Aloha.